Hi, and welcome to the Help, I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian webinar series. Uh, today we'll have a webinar with Jim Church, who is going to talk about international government survey data. Uh, Jim Church is the Librarian for Economics, International and Foreign Government Information, Global Poverty, and Political Economy at the University of California, Berkeley. He serves as the chair of the IFLA Government Information and Official Publications section and is also active in the ALA Government Documents Roundtable, where he writes the International Documents column for the journal DTTP. His primary areas of interest are in economic development and international non-governmental organizations. Uh, so thank you very much, Jim, um, for presenting to us today. Um, so what I'm going to cover today are some basics of um, international survey data. And uh, I lied a little bit about what this will cover. This is not just going to be limited to government surveys. I thought it would be more appropriate to include other international surveys as well, because in fact, the two kind of go hand in hand, those that are initiated by private organizations or universities or think tanks or whatever. Uh, I use all of these interchangeably. And uh, I think because the same thing is true for international government organizations and national governments and so on, um, it, it really, the distinction doesn't, doesn't quite matter. There's really nothing particularly special about um, a government survey and a survey that's uh, initiated by some other uh, organization. So the distinction kind of blurs there. What I'm going to talk about briefly here is the difference between uh, international microdata and aggregate data, uh, how to recognize when microdata is needed in the course of doing a uh, reference interview or patient consultation, databases where international survey data is indexed and hopefully well described, uh, a review of selected international surveys, and by that I mean selected because, of course, the scope of that is huge, a brief introduction to data documentation, and also a brief introduction to online data analysis tools. Okay. So what is aggregate data? Um, this can be one of the things where it's difficult to find a perfect definition, and I searched very diligently, and I kind of combined some that I saw <laughs> online with my own sense of what it means. But uh, basically, aggregate, whoops, I forgot, data are statistics combined from several measurements and that are organized by geography, time, or social observations. So some examples include many of the things that uh, librarians are uh, quite accustomed to or used to and have been dealing with for years. Things like unemployment rates, import and export data, national accounts, and so on. And uh, yeah, many, again, libraries, uh, government information librarians are quite accustomed to this stuff. They uh, have resided on uh, databases, table generating databases that many of us are familiar with that are produced by international organizations or in statistical yearbooks. And um, it, it seems pretty familiar, but I thought I would um, you know, explain what I meant by this you know, before we get into microdata. Okay. And some, here are some examples. Uh, international financial data from the IMF, um, employment data from the International Labor Organization, national account statistics from the UN, land and agricultural production from the FAO, and national literacy rates over time from UNESCO, and uh, summary census data from national governments. This is what I would uh, characterize as aggregate. And notice I say uh, summary census data uh, from national governments, not um, uh, microdata. We're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. Okay. So what are microdata? So microdata consist of data that are directly collected from a specific unit of observation, which is usually, and again, I, I want to hedge a little bit, uh, perhaps not always, an individual, a household, or a family. And uh, the unit of observation in most cases is the entity that answered a question uh, in a survey. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. A lot of the time when people are looking for microdata, they're going to mention words like surveys. And microdata are inherently very flexible because users can generate their own 
statistics um, from the data in the manner desired. As many of you know, you've been frustrated perhaps in the past by you get a table generator, you come across something in the yearbook, and it doesn't break down the way in which you would like it to. Um, so this is the advantage of working with microdata. You can uh, uh, manipulate it in ways that you can't uh, with these more traditional tools. And so that can be a little bit more difficult from uh, the end user perspective, but also gives us a lot more flexibility and power. And usually we'll also need something like uh, documentation in the form of a questionnaire or codebook uh, that is often needed to understand and interpret the data. So determining um, user needs, um, students and faculty may in fact know already that they need microdata, it will go out and tell you. And so if you're trying to determine whether aggregate or statistical data or microdata are needed, uh, you want to look for a few, a few clues in the question. Users may mention something like firm level or unit level or panel data. And uh, they, they may sort of begin to describe something in a survey that they've seen, or they may want to get all their observations from the same place. Usually things like this are a pretty good clue that you're going to need to use uh, uh, survey or microdata. And another good uh, tip or way of determining what is needed is you can always ask the user what is the unit of analysis. Is it a country, a state, uh, a firm, an individual, a household? If they respond that they need to look at households or individuals, so it's usually, although again, not always a good clue that microdata may suit their needs better. Okay. So I'm going to give you some examples uh, from recent questions. And uh, I also want to em emphasize that an intensive reference interview is often needed to determine um, uh, which type of data is, uh, is necessary for, for the user or would be best for the user to have. Uh, and these are all questions I recently got. Um, this is from a student said, I need the data for family income consumption and house prices in China. Uh, another one, again, these are not all one or the other. Maybe you can kind of guess which is which. Another one I recently got was, I need to find foreign direct investment between all countries. I hope to write a paper that analyzes the number of French tourists visiting the United States in the last 10 years. And my thesis topic is whether the cultural backgrounds of third culture kids has an impact on wages. I need to find data that includes the cultural and travel background of a person and their wages. And uh, if anyone yeah, again wants to, you know, you know, take a stab at that, uh, what I wound up doing uh, for the first one and the fourth um, question, uh, we wound up using um, microdata. Uh, the first one we wound up using a, a you know, a, a household panel survey in China. And the last one we wound up using actually um, the General Social Survey from the United States. Now, the last one, of course, is not international, but uh, just again, hopefully this will give you a, a sense of uh, you know the types of clues you can look for for a, in a in a question where you might potentially use this. Okay? So um, strategies for finding uh, international microdata. So of course, the the first thing you could do is familiarize yourself with uh, commonly used important surveys. Uh, you can search databases and archives that index data sets. And many of these now have uh, variable level search functionality and online analysis tools. Uh, very importantly, you can search the literature for related studies to find potential data sets of interest, which again is um, you know, it's a it's a useful shortcut because uh, if you just don't happen to know uh, where this particular variable will be found, uh, why not take a look at the existing literature and rely on the experts who do this for a living? And hopefully, if they cite their data well, uh, you will uh, be able to uncover it, discover it, and reuse it or repurpose it. Uh, it's also very important to conduct an intensive reference interview to ask a lot of detailed questions to determine the need. Uh, the, uh, the fifth point down the line there, read the codebook or questionnaire is extremely important. 
Uh, a lot of the times, the variable in question will be deeply buried uh, within the questionnaire of the code book. And I have a lot of respect for people who um, do this for a living, who do this and nothing else, because um, it is a very intensive uh, reference process where often you could spend a great deal of time examining uh, potential data sets, scrolling through the questionnaire of the code book to see the context of the question, the unit of analysis, how the question was posed, and uh, it can be very challenging, particularly in a survey that has uh, hundreds of, of questions or different uh, uh, different uh, uh, rounds. Uh, sometimes you'll find surveys vary from year to year, and they're not the same, you know, um, uh, each time that the the round is initiated. So that's also another point. And it also helps to uh, register uh, for access to significant data archives beforehand so you can help students at the point of need. Uh, it's becoming more and more common to, uh, it's becoming more and more common for these data providers and data archives to require that you register so they have a sense of the research purpose. And often that will require creating a, a simple statement of the research need and uh, you know, providing your, your background, uh, you know, your university email. Things like that are often needed these days. So it's helpful to do that ahead of time for uh, data archives that you know that you uh, could potentially be using. Okay. So these are some selected international data archives. I'm sure that many of you have heard of uh, at least several of these before. ICPSR, I expect many of you know, it's a consortium of institutions working together to acquire and preserve data on social phenomenon, uh, primarily United States, but I've noticed in recent years uh, its international holdings are becoming more and more significant. There are over 130 countries represented. Uh, the UK archives, the uh, UK data archives is the largest collection of UK digital social economic research, and uh, I'm not going to go into that in depth, but I just want to point them out uh, today for the because of the excellence of their metadata, which can be crucial in doing um, uh, this this type of reference and analysis. Uh, the Council on European Social Science Data Archives. So it's like a consortium of native da national data archives across European countries, and the Leibniz Institute of the Social Sciences, which is the principal principal repository for the Eurobarometer polls and the International Social Survey Program, which is absolutely huge. And one of these also I like at the end is the uh, something I don't work a great deal with, but um, still very significant in my opinion is ARDA, which is International Surveys on Religion, uh, Congregational and Denominational Data, and so on. And again, these are just some examples for many more. Okay. And, um, this is sort of my own little distinction here. I'm not sure if it's quite appropriate, particularly for the first one. There are also these um, sources out there I would characterize more as a data catalog. They might not contain the data itself, but they might uh, point it to other sources. Uh, the middle two certainly fall into that category, the World Bank Microdata Catalog and the International Household Survey Network Data Catalog, primarily World Bank and other international organizations that provide access to uh, household survey data and other uh, data of interest to uh, these groups. Uh, the one at the top, the Dataverse Network, is an enormously important source. Uh, it's a bit of a hybrid because it does uh, sort of link uh, research data, you know, universes. <laughs> uh, and it does serve as an archival purpose, but for my, in this particular instance, I'm just going to use it. I, I use it primarily uh, for a discovery source. So again, these things can be kind of fuzzy, but I'm just using this right now in that term. <laughs> One of my all-time favorite librarians is here, and I did not know he would show up, but of course here he is. Uh, this is, there are all these libguides out there as well that I use uh, myself if I'm looking for data by region or subject. This is an excellent libguide at um, the Princeton University Library. If you're looking for data by subject or by region, uh, I am jealous <laughs> that they have people who can spend all this time um, 
describing in depth detailed surveys by regions around the world and by subject. So this is awesome. And uh, you know, really appreciate uh, people who take the time to put this together to help us. And uh, another awesome lib, lib guide at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. They give you a little definition of microdata, and they present different types of microdata by you know sort of broad subject category. And maybe not all of these are international in scope, but still, um, I love it when people do this. It's so helpful to. Uh, give librarians a quick source to use at the point of need. Okay. So talk very briefly about ICPSR. Um, it does have a huge data archive of over 250,000 files, uh, specialized collections in education, aging, criminal justice, terrorism, other fields. Um, it does, again, have more and more access to um, international survey data. One of the great things about ICPSR is it uses SDA. And uh, maybe some of you will get to that in a second. This is an online analysis tool. And I think it's a great way for those of you who are new uh, to working with microdata to get an introduction to it and to get a sense of the power it, it has and what you can do with it. You can go into ICPSR and look for studies which, for which online analysis is available. And uh, I'm going to show you a bit of that in just a minute about how you can use this. It has a social sciences variables database that allows users to find variables and questions across studies or series. It has a bibliography of data-related literature. Data can be browsed by geography, series, theme, or topic. And again, it has databases for which data sets for which online analysis is available, as well as replication data sets, which allow users to, uh, you know, there are studies where previous data is used, and um, people, in a sense, are repurposing the data for their own uh, uses or to replicate uh, experiments which have already been done. So the SDA online analysis tool, I think we're all particularly proud of that here because it was developed at UC Berkeley. In fact, I've even met the guy who did it. Uh, it's a program for documentation, uh, web-based analysis for survey data developed here. It's uh, easy to use and designed to produce data analysis results very quickly. Uh, it can usually be used for cross-tabulation, means comparisons, correlation, and regression. And um, it has over several hundred studies that are available for online analysis with more being added. So here's an example of a quick uh, SDA cross-tabulation using a study which is called the Indian uh, Human Development Survey. And you can see here, what I thought I would do just very quickly is do a quick cross-tabulation that shows uh, the poverty rates among different castes by state in India. So you can see right there in the row column, or, the, or in the row, I have poverty status, which is indicated by the variable poor. In the column, I have group 8, which is um, the variable that they use in this particular case to indicate caste. And then I have a control variable, uh, which uh, is going to stack uh, the data on top of each other uh, by states in India. And if I wish, I could do other things like I could filter by age, I could filter by sex. All these things uh, demonstrate, if you haven't had the chance to do this, the, the kind of power that you have if you have access to microdata, because you can kind of um, control it yourself. You can tell the, the, uh, the, the data provider what exactly you want, and it will um, turn it out for you if that type of analysis is available. So you can see here, here's the cross tabulation. I have. Uh, the state here is Uttar Pradesh, which is a troubled state in India, and it has uh, poverty status for the different castes. It does things like you can draw little bar charts. It has pie charts. And again, it has other functionality in the most recent version, SDA version 4.0, where you can do regression analysis, comparison of means, correlation, and so on. It's a really neat tool, uh, a lot of fun to play with, and uh, it's great because it uh, it does U.S. data, but it also does increasingly amount of international data sets. So I'm a big fan of this. 
Um, not going to talk about our research data management much today. I know that's very much in everyone's minds. It's growing significantly, but ICPSR also provides links and tools uh, that enable people to do things like uh, do security for uh, security checks for restricted use data, text anonymization which you might want to do if you're publishing something, you don't want to accidentally reveal uh, the identities of uh, the uh, survey respondents. Uh, there are some links here to the data management planning tool, the DMP tool, which is actually done at the University of California, and OpenRefine, which is a data cleaning uh, tool that I've begun to play with a little bit. But all of these things are just tools and links added value by PCS, ICPSR offers. So the Dataverse project uh, is an open source web application to share, preserve, site, explore, and analyze research data. And uh, it's uh, a collection of repositories that may host, host multiple Dataverses. There are these repositories are available all around the world, and each Dataverse contains data sets, and each data set contains metadata and data files. So the important thing I think to remember about this is that it's got excellent metadata as well as data files. That is really the, the great advantage of robust um, discovery tools such as this is because uh, I think some of you can probably remember in the past where you would get to a data set that was mentioned in the literature and you would go online, you'd find the file, and you might find a little bit of documentation and like some sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, an ASCII file or just a, a readme.txt that was not particularly descriptive. Uh, sources like ICPSR and Dataverse are essentially requiring researchers to deposit this data along with much more descriptive uh, metadata, uh, things like, you know, the file formats are usually included, uh, related publications, um, they have things like version control, where you're supposed to distinguish the different versions, which the you know the uh, when the data you know new versions of the data when they are uh, made available, and all this is really is really very helpful for people when working with this content. So here is a a database search that I actually did the other day. You go into there and you do something like a survey, like uh, do a search for something like China social attitudes. Uh, something again, I infected, you know, a couple weeks ago. Came across this China Family Panel Study Dataverse, uh, which is made available from the Institute of Social Science Survey at Beijing University or Peking University. Okay. This is a description with the subject keywords. You can see here are some of the metadata. Okay, uh, the World Panel Study is a pretty good indication that this is, in fact, this is a, a microdata survey. Uh, it has keywords also here like communities, families, and individuals. These are additional clues. Uh, here is the, uh, the documentation. Again, very important if you want to understand what this is about. It gives you the background. It gives you tables of contents. Uh, if you want to just take a quick look at this, uh, you know, you, this is really why uh, it, it is worthwhile to pay detailed or close attention to what is in the questionnaire, because it isn't always obvious. Uh, you may find the sort of a study description, but sometimes, unless you already know, you really have to go drill deep into it and find out what, uh, what it is all about. So for example, this one has things like mobile phones, uh, which I would not have expected from this. It has a family questionnaire, has child questionnaires used on parroting. I wonder, for example, if you might be able to do a cross-tabulation about, you know, mobile phone use by <laughs> children and the, the, the parents' attitude <laughs> uh, about parenting. Uh, that, that could be an interesting study, perhaps, you know, if any of you have teenagers. Um, anyway, um, what you'll also find sometimes is that they will pro uh, may offer some restrictions. You may have to sign something uh, that state conditions of use. In this case, for example, this is absolutely not something that the University of California uh, would sign for ourselves because it would say we have to comply with the laws and regulations related to data, data confidentiality by the Chinese government. It's probably not something that UC Berkeley would sign, but it may be something that um, a researcher would be willing to do. And uh, 
they, if you are going to uh, assist people uh, with uh, this sort of data discovery and they're going to take it upon themselves, uh, it's important that you offer some due diligence to make sure that they understand the requirements, uh, which can be legal and enforceable when they are uh, getting access to this content. It's not trivial sometimes. And uh, again, I'll let you sort of think, if you want to go take a look at that survey, uh, the, the potential uses for it, considering the number of questions and the scale of the survey, are really immense. Uh, this is also something I think I'll point out. Uh, IPUMS International, I think many of you may know or have heard of IPUMS. It's often used uh, for United States census data via the American Community Survey. Uh, another thing, another commonly used um, feature of it is uh, IPUMS uh, has uh, access to microdata from the current population survey, uh, but IPUMS is adding new uh, data sets to its, uh, its library uh, or its system all the time. And uh, it has, in addition to U.S. Census data, it has um, a great collection of uh, foreign national census data sets. So a little different from the, uh, the IPUMS USA in that you do have to write a much more detailed uh, uh, description of your research topic. But uh, the great thing about this is that you can take a look at um, the variables uh, offered by different countries for censuses over time. And a lot of times, uh, they are uh, comparable. So this is, if anyone's asking, for example, about uh, a single source where you can get access to public use microdata across countries, uh, this is certainly, you know, an amazing place to go look for that. Okay? And something that they recently did, uh, which is really ex exciting to me because I just remember seeing it a few weeks ago, it, or I don't know, time flies now that I'm getting older, but uh, they now have access to these uh, USAID demographic health surveys, which are nationally represented household surveys that provide data, I mean, hundreds of data sets over time, although they're not all in here, for a wide range of um, indicators in the areas of population health and nutrition, child and maternal health, housing quality, and so on. Uh, I mentioned the UK data archives, which again uh, is enormously important uh, data car archive, obviously based in the United Kingdom, uh, available in a variety of software, provides most data free at the point of use, and the um, main reason I want to mention it here is because it has just amazing uh, metadata. So for example, here is a, an example, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, which goes all the way from 19... 98 to 2015. You can see the metadata which is done there. Uh, the, the data documentation initiative is the standard used for um, descriptive metadata for um, numeric data sets. Uh, you can see the citation for the study which is set out very clearly. It has a digital object identifier. It has subject categories. It has an abstract. Here I go through some of the the typical metadata elements that you might look for in uh, this type of system. And again, this is not, I'm not a metadata expert, but this is the kind of thing that I think, you know, should be, uh, should be included. You certainly want a basic study description, a citation with a persistent identifier, subject categories, documentation, file types, uh, coverage, uh, the methodology used, and related publications. All these can be extremely helpful when you're trying to evaluate a data set and help someone who's not already very familiar with it uh, to determine if it's useful. Okay. And there is also something, again, I've just learned about in the past year. This is something called the Data Seal of Approval, and I forget the international agency that has developed this. But uh, again, you know, in the past, the reason, uh, you, you know, data archives and researchers have taken the trouble to set out these standards, because in the past, you know, people were frankly rather sloppy. They would just take a data set and put it up somewhere on a web page with uh, completely inadequate documentation. It might disappear when the faculty retired or the institution shut down. Uh, now people are taking steps to encourage 
uh, producers to deposit the research data in a data repository that's going to last for a while. They're going to provide requisite metadata so it can be interpreted. Um, they're going to do all of these good things, you know, make sure that it's migrated on a timely basis. Uh, essentially, the idea is that, you know, uh, data will be uh, discovered and it will be where you can expect to find it for a long-term range. So uh, it won't just disappear or, you know, migrate, you know, get, you know, uh, be only available in an obsolete format or other things that I think many of us have encountered over the course of our, our careers where, you know, it just caused a great deal of trouble in terms of either accessing the data or you were using it. Moving right along, uh, here are some other discovery tools. Uh, this is one of my favorites. is a collection of international household surveys. Um, the World Bank is certainly an important player in this, but again, going back to that definition of what microdata is, uh, this is uh, a catalog that's put together by the World Bank and a number of other uh, international organizations that has accessed over 1,400 surveys and censuses and a million, <laughs> 250,000 variables, really quite a lot. Okay. Um, so here are some of the examples of the surveys uh, that are done. It's primarily for uh, surveys and censuses conducted in low and middle income, middle income countries. Uh, some of the most important ones include uh, World Bank Enterprise Surveys, Financial Inclusion Surveys, and Living Standards Measurement Surveys. And again, rolling right through here, uh, this is an example of a really important one. It's a household survey program done by the World Bank, which focuses on uh, generating data to uh, you know, build capacity. It's essentially giving a sense of the standard of living uh, through developing countries around the world. Okay? And so, again, you never really know what is going to be in these things. I just started browsing through uh, the questionnaire the other day for, this is, I think this is for Albania, <laughs> and it begins to talk about things like microfinance and uh, places where there are commercial banks, which is a rather hot topic around here. And this is, again, this is just one uh, page in the questionnaire. Uh, again, how would you determine this? How would you find this? You could be lucky like I was and just sort of going through it and say, okay, here's something to remember. Uh, you could find it maybe in the li related literature, but what is best, of course, is if um, these systems begin to develop uh, variable uh, level searches, so you can search it for the, the variable question. But again, not every organization will do that. It's labor intensive. So hopefully we'll see more and more of those systems developed as time goes on. And again, sometimes you come across these things. There's another example of the data agreement. Uh, the user may often have to fill out the form and explain what they're up to before uh, access is granted. And this is, again, this is something for an Ethiopian uh, living Standards Measurement Survey, I forget what the name, this is not, uh, I forget what ERSS stands for. Uh, it, it's a household survey measuring poverty in Ethiopia, essentially. Uh, but again, having found it, you may come to this place where you will not be able to take a look at it instantly. You're going to have to apply for access, and uh, the user will be granted it. And um, perhaps they and only they will have uh, access to it under the circumstances so that you may be able to work with them. Uh, this is, is a step that may involve having uh, your reference interaction going on with them over several days. Yeah. So here's some uh, example. This is an enterprise survey. It's a firm level survey uh, representative of economy's private sector. It covers the business environment, access to finance, corruption, crime, competition, and performance, and uh, the World Bank engages in face-to-face -face interviews with managers and business owners, and I know in uh, my economics department this is considered, uh, you know, an essential for uh, development, econ development economics. Okay? So here's one. Here's a data file for a sample enterprise survey, which has 303 variables uh, for the country of Afghanistan. Okay? And here uh, is a sample of some questions that were asked about firms. 
Okay. As you can see right here uh, on the left, these are the variable names, and each of them has a question that is associated with. Okay. So, I mean, some of these, again, are really amazingly detailed. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting. Fiscal year 1391, <laughs> which I guess uh, reflects the Afghan uh, calendar. I'm not sure, but <laughs> I, I presume it's not taking place in the Middle Ages. That must be what that means. So if anyone has any other ideas, I'd be curious to know. So uh, again, this is not comprehensive, but just mentioning some others. Here's another key one. This is done by one of my favorite international organizations. Uh, UNICEF, the multiple cluster indicator surveys face-to-face -face interviews with household members in a variety of topics. Uh, they claim it's the largest source of statistically sound, internationally comparable data on women and children worldwide. And it was a major source for Millennium Development Goals and will continue to be. Um, this is an instance where I myself have actually never uh, gotten access to the actual microdata because you have to write a very, very detailed description of what exactly you're after in doing this, but you can read the studies online. You get a sense of the variables and the questionnaires. So here, for example, are the mix for short. These are the questionnaires for the different rounds. And they have an indicator list, which is really recent. As you can see, it was already <laughs> updated in the second, uh, November 2nd, 2016. And as you can see, a, a certain round may have different questionnaires, some for women, some for children some for people of different age brackets. So it's important to take your time again with the patron and determine very specifically what they're after. And sometimes you just have to go through these. You may have to read several of these questionnaires before you determine uh, which one is right for you. So hats off and great respect to research data librarians who take the trouble to do this. Yeah. And so, for example, here is a list of the indicators, like iodized salt consumption, low birth weight, children weight of birth. It may sound kind of funny, but uh, these things are serious in the developing world. You know, what we do without iodine and salt, I think some of you know U.S. history, what, what, what happens when you don't have that. Okay, the World Value Survey, again, just sort of blowing through these really quickly, really important one. Um, one of the largest um, in the world getting a sense of values and how the people's values are changing over time. Uh, and it's internationally comparable across countries, uh, almost 100. Apparently, it's the largest non-commercial cross-national time series investigation of human beliefs. Um, and it crosses uh, many, many different countries from the very poor to the very rich. And again, the reason I mentioned it here, we're talking about government, has been used by the World Bank, journalists, uh, to understand linkages between cultural and development. Okay? So here is something I thought was interesting. I went online to one of their online analysis, to uh, one of their online data analysis tools, which we'll talk a little bit more about how we have time. And this is a sense, uh, this is a survey of India, and it talks about whether or not people can be trusted as a time series over time. And so as you can see, uh, in 1989, the 1989 to 1993 rounds, 34% uh, of Indian people said that people can be, uh, most people can be trusted. And going to the 2010-2014 round, it dropped to 21%. And the same thing in 89 to 93, they said 61%. You can't be too careful. And then from 2010 to 2014, it had risen to 74%. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions whether economic development <laughs> makes people more suspicious. I'm not sure if that's a valid conclusion, but it occurred to me. So that brings me to really quickly uh, the availability of online data analysis tools. So in the good old days, if you will, um, you needed or required to rely on uh, statistical software packages such as Stata SPSS and now recently R to do uh, tabulations and work with this data. But now what we're seeing is in addition to SDA, there is a growing number of uh, online data analysis tools that you can use to perform simple cross tabulations and basic statistical analysis. Okay. So here are some examples. Uh, 
SDA I mentioned. Nestar is one that's widely used in Europe and Canada, uh, used by the UK Data Service and the European Social Survey. Uh, one that I found, which I had not encountered before, which is uh, the Luxembourg Income Study Web Tabulator, where you have to install a Java application. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, maybe someone can help me pronounce this, Zakat, which is down, uh, which is used by um, uh, that that Leib the Leibniz uh, Center JSIS, which is used to analyze your barometer and the International Social Survey Program, and other barometers such as the Latino Barometer, Afro Barometer. Now they have their own online analysis tools. So here's an example of one. This is done by the European Social Survey. You can go like if you're going here on the left, you can choose country, you can choose the weights, you know, what you want to apply it to either a household. Uh, or an individual to make it generalizable to the population. You can essentially pick your, your variables over here, immigration, health, inequality, and you can create a simple cross-tabulation online. And although I won't do this now, you can do analysis, which will often mean uh, comparisons of means, correlation, and regression. Okay. And um, Luxembourg Income Study, probably don't have time to go into in detail, but this is another one where they allow you to do uh, online analysis. And here is an example of that. Uh, you do have to install uh, this Java to make this work. But it's certainly uh, very handy to be able to do this quickly to get a sense of what uh, is available. Although often, again, people will want to uh, take the data and put it into a more advanced statistical program, which will have many more features and greater power once they take the time to to use it, then you might be able to do it in an online environment. And here is um, the Latino barometer. And you can sort of be, uh, great thing about Spanish is that, you know, for me at least, I can kind of interpret a lot of this. I can go myself and do some of this online. So you can see right here, you can select the round over here, the ronda. You can select uh, the countries for the analysis. And you can go through and you can create your own tabulations online. And here is another one um, that is done by the Afrobarometer, which again, you have the Eurobarometer, all these barometers, Afrobarometer, Eurobarometer, uh, and, and, and uh, Latino barometer. And here is another example of one of these online data analysis tools. Okay. And here you can see you have the option of selecting the survey round. You have different table tools. And I think what I did here, again, <laughs> is I took a look at uh, uh, I created a pie chart of uh, a sense of your present living collections conditions in Cameroon, and 33.6% said they were fairly bad, 17.9% said very bad, 2.4% said don't know. I mean, this is the kind of thing, maybe I, I shouldn't just sort of, I can't part, I don't know the rest of you. I just like to kind of fool around with this stuff. Maybe it's not a good idea, but I love drawing charts and graphs and diagrams. To me, that's sort of the interesting thing about working with data, is it all kind of will light up and make sense to you uh, once you can draw a picture. And that's why I think data visualization is so important. And it will often uh, interest people. Uh, once you show someone that you can create a chart like this, and give, communicate a clear message simply. Um, this is a great advantage, I think, of these uh, online data analysis tools, which was not really available before uh, with, uh, with the other more traditional geeky stuff. Okay. So uh, I think I've finished about five minutes early, so which is pretty good for me. Uh, take questions if Thank you very it. much. <laughs> It's great. Um, you kind of hinted at this throughout, but which which tool do you think you use the most out of everything? I'm a biggest fan of ZipPums. ZipPums, yeah. Yeah, ZipPums is, uh, I mean, again, it's not as maybe international, but for me, you know, ZipPums and SDA really kind of blew my mind when I first began to use it and I saw what you could do. Um, ZipPums, of course, if you want the actual, you know, data, you're going to download the data. Sometimes you have to get a little familiar with some of the statistical software. Like, you know, if you download it into Stata, you have to do that conversion trick where it's going to be downloaded in the DAT format. You have to convert it to DTA using a do file. All that can be a little bit uh, of a, 
a, a showstopper at first, but <laughs> uh, I, I think that's a great. I mean, and, and you know, the, uh, the the Nestar tools and the other uh, tool that I, uh, is used by, um, uh, you, you know, the the the, uh, uh, the, the Eurobarometer and International Social Survey Program. Uh, these are all fantastic. Uh, and I love uh, Dataverse. I use that all the time. And I love other people's libguides. You know, if people can help me out with this and uh, provide good descriptive, um, you know, metadata, just descriptions of what all of these different surveys offer, I mean, that's great. The more people can help us out without the better. Okay. Um, yeah, the barometers are, my students love the barometers. They're <laughs> Anybody have any questions or comments? Any other tools that you like for international data? And it remains to be seen. I think that the, the ball is moving so fast that uh, what, you know, if anyone else with influence out there is listening, what would really be great is uh, if you could get um, more variable level uh, analysis tools where you could type the name of a variable into a search box and uh, get into a survey and you wouldn't have to do lots of browsing or reading of the documentation, but that may be a long way off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so to see ICPS are replicated, I mean, to an extent, many, many large data repositories are already doing that, but to see their great efforts replicated, you know, uh, more globally would be great. Oh, yeah, the demographic and health surveys are really awesome. They're yeah, great. yeah, I remember when that popped up on IPOM, so it was like, hooray. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our uh, nursing. They were huge, yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming. In. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.